Good evening and welcome to Cooperative Vermont. We're coming to you from VCAM Studios. It's Thursday, February 21st, 2013. I'm Matthew Kropp. And I'm Eric Davis. We've got a, a pretty pretty uh, packed show this evening. Uh, we've got we're going to start with um, some co-op news and then go on to our interview with um, some some folks involved with Co-op Power, which is a really interesting project uh, going on in uh, southern Vermont and Massachusetts. Right. We're trying a new new thing for this interview too. Yeah, we're going to be uh, doing it uh, remotely via Skype. So uh, you know, uh, fingers crossed for the technology. <laughs> um, but uh, sort of a few things on the agenda for, for news. First of all, the, um, the startup food co-op, Granite City Grocery and Berry, uh, is continuing to make some, some pretty steady progress. Uh, we've been reporting on them uh, r regularly each episode. In each episode, we've got, you know, it seems like more good news. Yeah. Um, so they, uh, they've, they, their goal is, uh, before they call in uh, equity, to actually sort of start the store 600 pledges, and they're up to 430. And that number seems to be growing pretty much daily. They seem to be really have some momentum going now. I, th I think on the last show they were at 400. Mm -hmm. and, you know, here we are, not even two weeks later, and 30 more members. So that's yeah. great. Um, and they just and there's some pictures on the uh, on our Facebook page. If you look for Cooperative Vermont on Facebook, that we uh, shared from theirs, uh, where they had a, a mixer potluck that brought in a whole lot of people, um, and seems to be it seems like they've got a really good community building around that mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. um, including a. Uh, uh, they, they've even started kind of like a youth club that there's a recent yeah. article posted on their blog about just sort of the, the conversations they've had with, uh, with kids and teenagers about sort of what, they, what, they, what their hopes for the co-op are, which is really cool to see you know, this kind of cross-generational um, engagement. Absolutely, absolutely. And they're, they're also, they seem to be getting really serious about looking for a site for the co-op too, which is, mm -hmm. you know, seeing that sort of really come together is, is really great. Yeah, so if you have any friends in the, uh, in the Washington County area who um, would like to see this project be, succeed, definitely encourage them to, to throw in a pledge. You know, it's, uh, uh, so, sooner they hit 600, sooner Barry will have a food co-op. Mm -hmm. um, so another, another thing that's on the agenda, and actually on the agenda for us later this evening, is the Burlington Telecom. Right, right. Yeah, um, so they're 38% um, of their goal at the moment, so that, I think that that's up about five percent from the last time we, mm -hmm. we, we taped. Um, so it's it's good to see that 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 progress, that project moving along as well. Yeah, there's um, seems to be little news. You know, it's the that that co-op the the project turning Burlington Telecom into a co-op is very very predicated on what the kind of final settlement is going to be between the city and the city of Burlington and city capital. So that's right. the that's the big question mark, and there's been no news out of that front. So well, except for that, it's been delayed. Right. No, exactly. Which, which is good. Gives more time for, for that sort of organization. Exactly. Um, right. Yeah, and similar to the Grand City Grocery, tonight we're going to be actually going to a, um, a gathering at the Frank Lloyd Wright Room at uh, the Three Needs, um, which uh, for, for, for beers and tech talk and co-op talk. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see. Hopefully there'll be some, some plans and projects for continuing the outreach coming out of that, that gathering um, beyond the, the Table and City Market, which has been continuing to happen every, every week. Um, and then sort of next is uh, something that's kind of close to you as a board member of Vermont Federal Credit Union. Uh, well, yeah, it came out in the Addison Independent uh, th this past week that um, Vermont Federal Credit Union is opening a, a, a new branch in, um, in Middlebury where they're taking over uh, the, the former space, uh, occupying the former space of Chittenden and um, People's United. Um, so that, that's great to see the credit union moving into a bigger, more prominent spot in the community. Um, in place of in place of a bank. Yeah, no, I, I definitely you know anytime a credit union is uh, is supplanting the, the space previously occupied by a bank, I feel like we're a little closer to the cooperative economy we're all t we're all talking about and getting excited over. It's a, it's a good trend. Oh yeah, um, and then uh, in terms of uh, conference planning, it's that we mentioned that last show, um, and that seems to be going uh, going pretty quickly, and uh, things are really coming together on that. Right. The cooperative panel is, uh, is, is, is looking quite exciting. Uh, so we'll be having a panel on the 17th of April and bringing together um, people from the credit union movement, uh, food co-ops, energy co-ops, um, agricultural co-ops. Um, we, we sort of 
almost have that, that, that worker co-ops as well worker co-ops we almost have that panel finalized and mm -hmm. it's a pretty exciting group yeah we've got four of the five major sectors that we wanted to have included already uh, already confirmed for it uh, and the fifth one just heard just heard today from the neighboring food co-ops association where they might actually be able to send a representative and if not they 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 have said that they would recommend a uh, uh, recommend sort of a representative one of their member co-ops to come so Great. it looks like that's going to be um, you know, something along the lines of the state of Vermont's cooperative economy. So, and 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 its potential, I, I feel mm -hmm. like as well. Where and you know, if you're if you're, it's going to be at UVM, and if you're unable to make it, we're going to try to also have um, have a uh, possibly a professional videographer there to to capture it. So we'll so we'll be able to perhaps even show it on the show. Yeah, yeah. And then the the conference itself is going to be shortly thereafter um, on the the twenty seventh, yep. um, and that's still coming together, but. It's a new economy conference with a number of different tracks, um, divestment, healthcare, but we're going to be putting together the, the co-op track, kind of one with one session talking about sort of big picture, like what does a cooperative economy look like, and uh, the other, the other, the second, the second session being more about the nuts and bolts of, um, you know, how does, how does that building process work? How do you, how do you start a co-op? You know, how do you engage in democratic politics within a co-op? I'm right. um, really sort of equipping the, the people going there with the, the tools to really sort of become engaged cooperators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I think the, the last thing we had on the agenda for news before we jump into our interview was um, the website. Uh, right. Um, so we, um, there was a, we put out a call um, recently for essays for our website at, at Co-op Vermont, um, Co-op VT, mm -hmm. right? at wordpress.com and we also we're, we're looking for people to contribute and there's a new piece um, that was added an original cooperative Vermont piece that was added this week um, talking about the collaboration between City Market and Burlington Telecom yeah and I think the hope is really to sort of have it become a space for you know any news or thoughts or opinions about kind of where co-ops in Vermont are going or you know, and even even space for debate of if there's you know issues that, that co-ops are taking different um, stances on that, you know, it can be a forum for 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 really us to have a kind of keep this conversation about the co-op movement going. So if you're interested, um, you know, you can uh, you can check out the website coopvt.wordpress.com. Um, you can also again go to our Facebook page, Cooperative Vermont. Uh, but with that, uh, I think that. Pretty much covers the uh, the co-op news. So, you want to introduce our uh, our guests for the evening? Sure. Um, it's our pleasure to have um, Michael Bosworth and Tom Simon from Co-op Power of Southern Vermont on the show today. Um, we had Avram Pot um, at, from an electrical co-op on the last show, and and this is sort of uh, focusing more on community scale and um, neighbor to neighbor um, energy projects. Um, and it's a really really cool project. So. We're, we're, we're very excited to have you guys on the show. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So do you want to maybe start off um, by giving us a little rundown of, um, of what Co-op Power is and how it came to be? Sure. And, and I'll, I'll read this so I get it right. Um, Co-op Power uh, is a regional network of local communities, uh, which we call local organizing councils. And it's creating a multi-class, multi-racial movement for a sustainable and just energy future. So that's sort of our mission statement. And I think it, it encapsul encapsulates everything that, that we're striving for. That's great. That's a powerful mission statement. It really incorporates a lot of, a lot of values in there. And mm -hmm. it's a, that's great. So, so, so where did, um, did Co-op Power come from? What's, what was the sort of impetus behind this, this initiative? Yeah, it really started in uh, Western Massachusetts, down in the, the Franklin County section of Western Massachusetts around Greenfield. A bunch of people were interested in um, getting biodiesel fuel for their, their cars, their grease cars, etc. So um, Co-op Power formed around that idea. And uh, about 10 years ago, Tom, mm -hmm. about 10 years ago it started and uh, started gathering members. Membership in the whole co-op uh, is about 400 right now, including all the different local organizing councils. Uh, and a lot of that membership early on was in um, the uh, Connecticut River Valley in Western Massachusetts. Uh, and that project is still going on. It still needs some funding, but it has 
now has built a building to produce the biodiesel. It does need funding, additional funding to uh, actually outfit it and start and start in operation, but it's, it's made a lot of strides. Um, and so from there, it started to branch out into other areas that are interested in energy issues. And it's about three years ago or so that the Southern Vermont started getting interested. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I, I was part of a group um, that was organized by Post Oil, and um, we met for three to four years looking for some way to promote renewable energy uh, projects in southern Vermont. And we looked at all the different models we could find, and, and the one we kept coming back to was co-op power. And, uh, you know, like most things, it may not be perfect, but it was the best thing out there that we could find, and, and we still haven't found anything better, you know, in the three years that we've been a local organizing council. So it's uh, really suited us well and helped us to move forward on some community-sized, uh, sustainable, renewable energy projects. Um, so could, could you um, tell us a little bit more about what membership in the cooperative means and, 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 and what what the members get get out of the membership? Yeah, um, maybe, uh, Tom will be able to fill in a lot of the details. He, he's been at it more serious for a longer period of time than I have, but uh, it's a consumer energy co-op so that people who join uh, get benefits for themselves uh, at home uh, in different energy realms, such as reduced pricing on solar hot water equipment, or such as um, becoming part of a fuel purchasing group, or we even have one a vendor around here, one a company that's willing to give a reduced price on uh, window quilts. Um, so different uh, benefits to the members such as those. The, the other reason for joining Co-op Power and, uh, is that we're interested in developing community-owned energy projects. So those uh, are not necessarily projects at home, but uh, that are you know, community-owned. And we'll talk a little bit more a little bit later, I think, about the uh, solar array that we've had installed on top of the new Brattleboro Food Co-op building. But um, Tom can give you more details, I think. Sure. I think one of the, the basic benefits that we offer our members is a fuel purchasing group. And this um, last heating season, we were able to get uh, a really good price on uh, propane. Um, we weren't able to get quite as much for uh, home heating oil, but we still are able to get our members a discount. Um, and firewood and um, wood pellets are also available through uh, Co-op Power Fuel Purchasing Group. And the idea is that we hope that we can save our, our members um, at least the amount that they'll put in for a membership over the course of uh, three, four, or five years, and then they can continue that savings. Um, one of the things that really differentiates uh, co-op power is that we do have um, what most would consider pretty substantial membership, um, but we too try to make it uh, affordable uh, to people that uh, may not have uh, a great income or a substantial income. Uh, the, the top membership uh, to join Co-op Power is $975, and that's a one-time membership, uh, lifetime membership. Uh, you don't ever have to put any more money in. Uh, we also have a, a $750 level uh, for members that uh, have some sort of uh, income off of the land, whether it's a farmer or uh, fishing or forestry work. Uh, we have another membership level at $500 uh, that's geared towards uh, limited income families, uh, families that, um, you know, household income, maybe $30,000 or less a year. And then we also have a, a $250 membership level um, geared mostly for renters that, you know, may not uh, be... Uh, into the fuel purchasing group so much. They, their landlords may purchase the fuel. Um, they might never do weatherization or insulation work. Uh, they might not purchase a solar system. 
um, but they still want to be a part of co-op power. They want to support the mission that we were undertaking. So we try to really make it available to most anyone. And we also work with people uh, on a basis that they can work at. Uh, a lot of people don't have a big pot of cash or uh, a lot of money sitting in the cookie jar uh, these days. So you know, we have some limited income families that pay $10 a month or $30 a month, whatever they can afford, uh, so that they can be part of really what we're, we're trying to put together here uh, as a cooperative. So one, one question that emerges for me from that um, is so if you have these kind of different, different levels of membership, um, in terms of people's participation in governance, um, is, are all of the membership, memberships sort of treated equally, or is it you know, because there's different projects that people participate or don't participate in, are these projects kind of governed in a parallel way? How does that, how does that work? Mm. Um, everyone, uh, every member, regardless of the membership level that they join at, uh, has a vote. And so there's no differentiation there. Um, the only other differentiation is with the $250 member level. Uh, those members are eligible for f the fuel purchasing, but wouldn't be eligible for uh, purchasing, uh, for example, solar equipment, uh, or weatherization or insulation work. Um, in most cases, they aren't going to, um, you know, that's not going to be something that they're going to be that interested in anyway or able to utilize um, being a renter. I just want to make one other uh, remark about the sort of the high entry fee. I mean, I think a lot of people might say, oh, $975. Even if you go to the seven fifty or five hundred dollar level, that's pretty high. One of the things about co-op power is it started around whole, this idea of a community-owned uh, energy project, you know, the biodiesel plant, and so that's part of the reason for its being, and, and that's part of the reason uh, people get interested in co-op power, not only consumer products for themselves, but also um, you know, interest in community owned um, you know, solar project like we did or other projects like that. So, so you need some equity, some uh, member equity to get those kind of project, projects going. Mm -hmm. well, that's, you that's, know, that's, an interesting aside, I'll just add to that. Um, when they first uh, started looking at the co-op model, um, they had suggested a much, much lower membership. And um, the people that were interested in forming the co-op came back and said, what's the maximum amount that uh, you know we can have as a membership? And uh, I believe it was $1,000 at the time. And they said, well, you know, if we're gonna have a membership of $50, we're never gonna raise enough money to do much of anything. So we need to be able to, you know, raise the, or, you know, pick up the ante so that we can be able to afford some of these larger projects that we're all feeling like we need to support and, and want to help have a, or have a piece of the ownership. So that, that was another reason that the, uh, the membership levels were set, the bar was set pretty high. So um, you know, you, you mentioned this. Uh, yeah, this might be a good good segue into the, discussing the uh, the projects a little bit, uh, the big projects you're working on. But um, so 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 tell us a little bit about what this um, this biodiesel plant project um, was all is all about. Well, there, as Michael was uh, saying, that you know there was a group that wanted to have a supply of used vegetable oil and not have to process it themselves in their garage. And so they were looking at uh, a commercial operation to do that and, and be able to take the used vegetable oil out of the waste stream uh, where a lot of it was going at the time and be able to reprocess it and replace some of the fossil fuels that were you know, taking out of the ground. Um, so they started um, really looking at a number of different models and um, you know, the, the project is pretty substantial. They're looking at producing um, uh, three and a half million gallons a year. And uh, interestingly enough, it's about a three and a half million dollar project. And we've been able to raise uh, a little more than two million, um, mostly through member loans and equity that people have put in through their membership. So the memberships that people pay 
uh, at least 75% uh, of that amount has the ability to go in as equity for one of these projects. And that's what we did in southern Vermont for the Brattleboro Food Co-op project. 75% uh, of all of the members that paid in a membership uh, went as a, uh, an equity share in that project. And uh, only 25% is actually used to keep the co-op uh, going as far as uh, paying the overhead, uh, the lights, the bills, and payroll. So could, could you tell us a little bit more about that, that particular project in Brattleboro, um, sort of the maybe how it came about. Um, it's, it's, I, I think the collaboration between the food co-op and the energy co-op is great, and um, maybe some of the economics of it, how much it costs, and where, where the payback point is. And, and mm -hmm. Sure. Um, right, you know, it seemed, you know, the Brattleboro Food Co-op, uh, a number of, well, four or five years ago, was starting to plan for the new building. It's re, you know, it had an older building. It was getting space constrained about being in that building. Okay. So it, it took, you know, several years to go through its process with its own membership. That yes, they did want to build a new building. And I say they, I'm a, I'm a member of the Brattleboro Food Co-op, and I think Tom so is I, as well. Yeah, so we're both so members we, of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and uh, so it occurred to us, you know, this might be a good project. It might be a very good fit, uh, one co-op working with another. And so we, we broached this subject with the uh, leadership of the Brattleboro Food Co-op. Uh, they were very open to it. They, in, in planning for this new building... Can I, can I ask they, one, one question real quick? Um, so just when you, when you say you broached with the, with, the, with the leadership, was that you went to the, you went to the manager, you went to the, a board meeting and pitched it? How, what did that look like? We actually broached it with the manager and some of the others, um, so they took it to their board. We we didn't we didn't specifically pitch it to the board, yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know the um, the food co-op in thinking about their new building wanted to have it be as energy efficient as possible, and there are an awful lot of really quite uh, advanced energy fe features to it, including using some of uh, the heat, waste heat from refrigeration, et cetera. But they didn't have enough money to actually then also put uh, an array of solar PV panels on top of the roof. So uh, they still said or they wanted to do it. They were thinking they might have to wait several years to do that. Uh, so when we stepped in and said we'd be interested in doing that, they said, "Oh, great, because then we could have you know the same thing happening on top of the roof and not have to wait." So uh, again, it was it seemed to be a good fit. And so, so what what was the um, kind of your source of the co-op power source of financing for those uh, photovoltaics? Were you able to get loans? Was it uh, from the member equity? Like, kind of where did that that money come from? Yeah, it's really really a combination. It was, you know, we started by um, having uh, member equity because we had a certain amount of existing members uh, who had uh, joined within the last several years, and then this was a good uh, sort of um, recruiting tool to get new members. So uh, we sort of joined that member equity with uh, member loans. And one thing about co-op power in general is that any member can choose, could look at um, an opportunity in a pro for a project in some other local or organizing council's area. So part of the member loans are actually from people not in Southern Ver Vermont, although certainly part, uh, a whole large part is from people in Southern Ver Vermont. Uh, so we joined that uh, also with the, we applied to the state of Vermont for um, the small scale incentive program that the state has, and we're able to secure that. And then in addition, the um, grant from the federal government, uh, and we're still actually working on that one. There's some, <laughs> we might call technical difficulties. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, we're still waiting on that one. Um, and we also were able to get some interim uh, loan money from a place in uh, Western Massachusetts called Equity Trust. Uh, they normally have loan to 
uh, more agriculturally oriented projects, but they saw this as something they might want to do more of in the future. Mm -hmm. So when we had sort of a gap to fill, uh, they stepped in and uh, were able to fill that. So one of our members uh, uh, actually suggested that uh, equity trust. Um, so. mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, uh, sort of, for the power that is generated from there, is it um, is it something that primarily is is kind of bought by the uh, the, the food co-op, or is it um, just go into the grid and sort of who, like, what's what's the sort of the, the nature of the kind of relationship there? Yeah, it's a, a net metered project, so the power produced is going right into the grid, although I'm sure all the power is going right into the building. Um, <laughs> The amount of power that they need is um, actually quite a bit more than what's being produced. We put as many panels on the roof as we could possibly fit, but because of ventilation systems and uh, heat exchangers and other things that had to go on the roof, um, we had to give up some area so we couldn't quite fill the roof completely, but we did uh, manage to capture every square inch of sunlight surface. <laughs> Um, as far as the, the power goes, we, we're actually in a, a leasing agreement with the Brattleboro Food Co-op. So they're making um, payments to, um, to co-op power uh, over the period of time uh, the, of the lease, and then they'll buy out after, um, at the end of the lease. And so that um, they are also getting the credit from the power mm -hmm. on their phone bill. Or their electricity bill. Or electricity bill. Oh, <laughs> phone bill. Electricity bill. Thank you, Michael. I, I was wondering if Co-op Power was the beneficiary of that net metering program, but it, it's the Co-op, and they're paying Co-op Power in a separate agreement. That's correct. Yes. Uh, there have been other projects that Energy Co-op have done where the, the members of the Co-op have uh, seen the benefit on their electricity bills. Uh, you know, up in Middlebury, the Acorn uh, Energy Co-op there has, has built such a such a project. Yeah. Um, I just uh, had a little senior moment earlier. The person who thought of equity trust for the gap financing is uh, Alice Mays, who's been quite active on our steering group. So. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, you know, again, one of the, the great things about cooperatives is just being able to bring a group of people together and that have uh, expertise in so many different areas that, you know, just by uh, combining all of our so-called brain power, we're really able to pull this off. So, um, you know, we really have to thank uh, all of our members here in Southern Vermont for, um, you know, everything that they've done to contribute to this project and and others um, as we go forward well that that, that that's um, I, I think you're totally right on the sort of social capital that's created through just cooperation is 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 amazing and that that might be a good segue into sort of how members are involved in the governance of the co-op and um, in, in advisory sort of capacities um, how does the co-op sort of utilize that member energy Sure. Uh, there are certainly uh, different points during the year when members are invited to come together and there's an annual meeting uh, and there are other uh, periodically leadership retreats everybody is invited to. Um, in general, you know, there is a, a board of co-op power and Tom's actually on the board and, uh, and they make the ultimate decisions. So when the Southern Vermont uh, Local Organizing Council wanted to do this solar roof array, uh, it's, uh, we didn't have the ultimate authority to say yes because we're, we're not the legal entity. The legal entity is um, co-op power in general. Mm -hmm. And so that board you know, gave, you know, made the decision to go ahead. Um, so uh, we're still working out some of the um, ways the local organizing councils work with the, the common office, what we call the common office. Um, yeah, as far as uh, decision making or you know getting information and stuff, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the way we're we're set up is um, really sort of interlocking in that um, each local organizing council has a, a steering group or committee, and there's a member uh, from every local organizing uh, council on the main co-op power board, 
And then there's also another member on the board that's also a member of each local organizing council steering group. So in effect, um, you know, everyone's got a voice. And that, again, is uh, made it so that uh, we have some input into other projects that other local organizing councils are, are um, taking on. And, and again, it's just a meeting of the minds so that it really opens up uh, to a larger degree uh, to be able to pull more um, cooperative people together to accomplish a whole lot more. Um, we also um, are able to really capitalize on um, not reinventing the wheel a lot of times as far as uh, legal work or accounting goes. And so that, uh, you know, being able to um, pull that, some of those functions together uh, really saves us uh, on the, at the local organizing council level uh, a lot of time, energy, and money um, when we can pool resources to, to take care of some of those areas. Does, one thing that, uh, that brings up for me is uh, a theme that I've noticed in, uh, you know, interviewing people from different, uh, from different co-ops is that um, oftentimes uh, co-ops will find their kind of staff um, come from sort of within the co-op in many times rather than kind of coming from without. How, um, like how many uh, paid staff does co-op power have and sort of how have they, have they sort of come into the project? Has it been mostly sort of people who are interested in this professionally or is it sort of something that, do you, do you have people who've kind of come up from the membership and then been so passionate about the project they just start working for it? Well, we, we do have uh, a lot of volunteer um, help uh, from time to time, and um, we also have paid staff. Um, I think there's uh, maybe uh, six or eight in the common office, um, but we also have in um, Massachusetts uh, some weatherization and insulation crews that Co-op Power has helped to start and uh, and run because there is a real need um, for more weatherization and insulation work in, in that area and there, there wasn't enough uh, businesses to handle it. Uh, here in southern Vermont we, we've got a number of companies that are already doing weatherization and insulation work so we didn't really feel that that was a need. So if you, if you count the uh, staff on the weatherization and insulation um, teams I think we're somewhere up around 30 um, paid staff. The um, chief um, officer, chief executive officer in Co-op Power is a woman named Lynn Benander. And early on, she was uh, helping. She was consulting to the group that wanted to form what turned out to be Co-op Power. And she worked for Cooperative Development Institute. And so she knew uh, a lot about cooperative principles and, uh, and practices. And so she got excited enough about the project that, um, and they asked her to become the the head, and she still is. Um, I think some of the other people who are, uh, well, the the person who sort of spearheaded the energy efficiency program, sort of made the was a member who made the proposal that you know Co-op Power could do this because he was quite he had some background in it, he was quite interested in it, and so he got, he got that going. So I think it's sort of a combination of people. Uh, coming up through the membership and and then some high reads from outside who are you know still interested in the type of work but uh, you know who may not have been members members at the time. Yeah. I think what what we find though is that um, uh, all of uh, the paid staff of uh, Co-op Power uh, really doesn't view it as a, a nine to five job. Um, they have some sort of passion as well. Um, and end up uh, probably doing more than what they're paid for uh, in many cases and, and really going above and beyond uh, as far as what you know a normal job uh, description would be considered. So, uh, so we're, we're very thankful uh, for the paid staff that we have and all of the efforts that they put in, in on our behalf. In, in terms of uh, utilizing um, that the volunteer membership, um, what one thing that really um, st um, struck me was the the neighbor to neighbor program. It's sort of an interesting approach to like member work almost in in some co-ops. Um, 
And I think, Tom, when we met before, you described it as sort of like a solar barn raising. So I was wondering if you could sort of talk about these initiatives that build community um, within the cooperative. Mm -hmm. um, well, we, we have, um, you know, as a member benefit, um, our members can purchase uh, solar equipment at a discount. And we also have a number of solar installers that will give our members either a discount or a rebate. But we find that there is a, a good a majority of our members that might be able to afford to purchase the equipment, but they can't quite make the leap to hiring a professional um, company to install the system for them. So we came up with um, a member to member or neighbor to neighbor program and, and actually it was uh, sort of copied off of some other cooperative programs in the area. Uh, I don't think it was anything that any of us came up with but we saw that uh, it was being done and it, it was being very successful. Um, we sort of jumped on the bandwagon and were able to uh, harness uh, some of the volunteer efforts uh, you know, of our cooperative and to help people get some of these uh, at least solar hot water uh, systems installed on their homes. And uh, you can fill in a little bit more on how it works. Sure. Uh, you know, the person who's the homeowner has to um, agree to help out with other people's neighbor to neighbor installation as well. So it's uh, not just a free ride for the homeowner as far as the volunteer help, but uh, it's sort of like you know the the typical you know barn raising effort where a whole bunch of people come together. Um, pretty much can be done in a day. Um, most of the, you know, there are a professional or two sort of in charge, so we you have to know you have to have people there who really know what they're doing. Because uh, sometimes you, you know, you're putting these, this equipment on somebody's roof, you don't want roof penetrations that later leak or whatever. So you have to have people there know what they're doing. But even the volunteers, you know, we have a training program internally, so a lot of the volunteers have taken some kind of training. So they know, you know, they have some awareness of what they should be doing. Uh, but on you know a Saturday or whatever, people get together uh, and uh, install it, maybe working that same weekend. Um, and then um, there are other uh, installations like that where that person who, whose uh, house it went on would participate in, in their, their neighbor's installation. Um, right now, a lot more of these have been done in, in Massachusetts, in, in Western Massachusetts and in Southern Vermont, though we have done a couple. We're looking to do more, um, but, um, but it is a great program. Mm -hmm. And, you know, another part of uh, Co-op Power's mission is really education. And the educational value of these programs is just immense. Um, you know, people can come in without knowing anything about a solar hot water system and leave feeling like they really have a much better idea of how it works. And it also, uh, you know, informs the homeowner. So the homeowner has a really good idea of how his system is functioning. And, you know, should there be a, a minor glitch, he's got a much better chance of being able to work on it himself as opposed to uh, feeling helpless and having to call someone else. But certainly we, we still have, uh, you know, professional uh, advisors that... Uh, can come back and, and take care of any, uh, you know, issues that may come up. So um, one thing that, you know, you've got, you've got all of these members, um, you know, in, in these organizing councils in Massachusetts and now in southern Vermont. Um, is there any sense of, you know, I'm, I'm just sort of curious as to, you know, this, this energy co-op idea. Uh, you mentioned another one up in the Middlebury area. Um, like, how, how does, how do you feel that your that um, that co-op power kind of compares or relates to other energy co-ops working around the state and around the country? Uh, good question. I'm I'm not sure which other co-ops have sort of the local organizing council structure, so that might be different. I think I don't know a whole lot about Acorn and Millbury, but I think they're just they're one entity. Uh, and doesn't have uh, you know the the different local organizing councils, so they're uh, sometimes simple is good. You know sometimes you know our our structure can get complicated at times, so uh, it's not the be all and end all. Um, 
other type of cooperatives. I mean, we certainly you talked in your news program about the the new food co-op in Barrie and you know the Brabrook Food Co-op or Putney or elsewhere. You know, those generally are are one entity working on on, on the one project. So. I guess co-op power is different in that sense, uh, in its its multi sort of multi faceted structure. Or, uh, yeah. Yeah, it seems the, like almost a the, federation or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other interesting um, piece is that the um, the focus or interests of the different local organizing councils is also different. Um, we had a leadership retreat um, this past weekend, and uh, we have a, uh, a local organizing council down in the Worcester Mass area. And, uh, you know, one of the big um, draws for them is a green jobs program. And they have been uh, working on uh, developing that, and, and Co-op Power has actually done a lot of work um, taking uh, young people that, for whatever reason, may not have continued with their schooling, uh, and be able, being able to pull them in and teach them uh, as far as the weatherization and insulation work goes, and then employing them in our uh, energy efficiency teams uh, down in Massachusetts. Um, this is something that I think uh, you know we'd certainly like to do uh, more of or look at doing more of here in southern Vermont as well, but uh, it really just hasn't been uh, our focus at this point, but certainly it's been the focus of, of other uh, local organizing councils and, and it's been a, a huge help and I, I think it's been a, a tremendous service that you know we've, we've helped with the, uh, to give back to the community. I wanted to just uh, fill in uh, your audience may not be totally familiar with Brattleboro or the details of the Brattleboro Food Co-op, but uh, when we say Brattleboro Food Co-op building, we're actually misstating because it's actually itself is a joint building. Uh, it's four stories. Its ground floor is it's the, the new store. Second floor is the offices of the Brattleboro Food Co-op. The top two floors are owned by a different entity, it's a housing trust. And um, so the Winder, Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust which has been around for more than 20 years, done a lot of good work in this area, and um, and all of the units uh, were quickly occupied and quickly rented. So uh, it's really nice housing as well. We talked early on about whether some of the um, electricity that the array would generate might go to the housing trust. It would have been complicated because they actually have separate meters for each a rental unit. Uh, they didn't mind uh, the fact that it would have been, it, it was easier for us to, to just work with, with one entity, the food co-op, and so that's the way it ended, ended up. So, so um, you know, you've been the you've been working in s southern Vermont and uh, in Massachusetts. Um, is, are there are you aware of in any other sort of is is the organization continuing to expand? Are there new kind of proto? councils emerging in, in other places? Um, kind of like what is the limit of the size that, um, that you really see co-op power or the, the ex expansiveness of, of it? Uh, is, is there sort of a limit that's, that's already been set? Is that like an ongoing discussion? Is it pretty much based on like if other groups are interested and want to form one in, or in you know, central Vermont or northern Vermont, that would be a possibility? Like what's, what, what, what's that future looking like? Well, we, we think that's definitely a possibility, and you know we invite um, people from other areas to look at our model and check us out. And if it's something that they're interested in, really to talk with us. Um, certainly, um, we've been using a little bit more technology uh, as we're doing today with Skype. Um, <laughs> And we have a local organizing council in the Boston area. And so it's a, a long drive to uh, Hatfield, Massachusetts, where our common office is uh, located. And, uh, you know, I've also Skyped into meetings there. Uh, so we're, we're trying to be, um, you know, cognizant of uh, saving uh, energy and, and fuel and not traveling great distances. 
And so I think technology allows us to expand, um, you know, a little bit further than we might ordinarily uh, think of. Um, certainly when, when we looked at forming a local organizing council in southern Vermont, um, we sort of had the idea of going or not making someone travel more than an hour to come to a meeting or a, an event. Um, so that was sort of, uh, you know, what we were looking at, but we certainly didn't want to limit it. Uh, you know, if there were people that were a little bit further out and were interested, we certainly would welcome them to join our local organizing council. Or if there were enough people, either in central or northern Vermont uh, or uh, New Hampshire uh, or even going over into New York uh, that are interested, we certainly would uh, help them to get a local organizing council started and uh, you know, be able to duplicate uh, what we've been doing and, and all the ones that we have that are existing today. And so, so what does that process look like to start a new, a new organizing council? Um, is it the sort of thing where, um, where people who've already been involved who are kind of far afield might start trying to create their own sort of a, a new one? Or is it something like, a, or is it different in each place? Kind of like what's the experience been so far? I think it's been different in each place. Um, we actually have um, a, a local organizing council starting up in um, the Blackstone Valley in New York. And we usually um, try to recommend uh, getting a core group of at least 20 members that would be interested in forming a local organizing council. Uh, you know, looking at that as a really what you need for a core group. Um, to really have enough people to move forward. Um, this particular council in uh, New York, um, I think, looked at our website and just said, this is what we want to do. And I think they had 10 members at the time and said, don't worry, we'll come up with another 10 and more. And so we said, okay. And so we're helping them to you know, get started and, and become a uh, full local organizing council. So looking back specifically at Co-op Power of Southern Vermont, um, how, how many members does, your, does Co-op Power of Southern Vermont have and what's membership growth looked like um, so far? Well, when, when we started uh, the local organizing council in Southern Vermont, we had um, 12 members. Uh, or 12 uh, families that had already joined Co-op Power. Uh, they wanted to be a part of um, the mission that we'd undertaken and really were looking at uh, developing the biodiesel plant that was being built in Greenfield. Um, so they, they launched right in, even without a local organizing council, and, and joined. Um, since then, um, about three years ago, we started, um, and again, with a, a core group of people, um, got the local organizing council off the ground, and we've been growing steadily. Uh, right now, I think we're up to 47 members. Uh, you know, we'd like to be 100 and more uh, so that we could afford to be able to undertake more projects and really to help our members become more sustainable, uh, limit their use of fossil fuels, uh, help them to, you know, get a better price on what they're they're having to purchase now. But the whole idea is is to move them off of uh, propane and fuel oil, um, you know, more onto solar and uh, wind and other renewable um, energies, so that we can really start to make a dent in our carbon footprint. Um, following along that vein, we we've, we've also uh, signed on as um, a supporter of the Vermont uh, Home Energy Challenge uh, that the state uh, through Efficiency Vermont has undertaken. And we're encouraging all of our members to really jump on this program and, and have an energy audit done, um, you know, get the necessary uh, weatherization and insulation work done so that they can really cut down on their fuel usage. And, and get a handle on that and make it that much easier to move into uh, the renewable energies. 
Um, so as as the sort of benefits accrue from the Brattleboro um, project, is the co-op looking at other sort of community scale um, projects, or is that too far out in the future? I, I wouldn't say it's too far out. We're beginning to think and, and discuss internally for sure. Uh, we would, um, at least some of us, uh, would like to do the type of project that ACORN has done up in Middlebury, where it's a group net metered uh, solar electric project, but where the, the electricity becomes a credit on the uh, those people who are participating in it, uh, rather than an entity like the the, the Brattleboro Food Co-op. Um, I think that's also potentially a good recruiting tool. People would see that and maybe want to become uh, you know participate in such a project. Uh, we're also we're not not sure yet, but there's a possibility that we'll be some kind of, kind of partner in a solar store uh, in Brattleboro, um, one that you know focuses on uh, solar products for solar energy as well as uh, helping people get up and going with with those projects. So that's another possible project. We yeah you know, we are still sort of completing some of the aspects of the the solar roof project that we've already done so uh that has taken us a while so um yeah but we're, we're looking forward to <laughs> yeah you know i think that it's almost like the sky is the limit um you know i've just recently been approached by another group that um shares a lot of the values and mission uh that co-op power has and would really like to find some way that we can combine forces and um, you know be able to uh, have a, sort of like a joint membership. Um, so I, you know I think it's really starting to take off. Um, you know one of the keys uh, really for developing these larger community-sized um, solar arrays is really finding partners that uh, share our mission and values and can utilize uh, tax credits. In other words, they're profitable individuals or companies um, that would have money to invest and be able to take advantage of the uh, federal tax uh, incentives that are in place for these projects. So that's something that we're, we're actively reaching out for and, and encourage anyone that uh, you know, this might strike a, a good tone with to, you know, get in touch with us to see if there might be something that uh, we could get together with in the future. Uh, and w one other question I had, um, we're starting to run a little short on time, but um, is, is, you know, I noticed recently the, uh, was it the Energy Co-op of Vermont um, or Vermont Energy Co-op? Energy mm -hmm. Co-op of Vermont, I believe. Right, up in uh, up in this area, um, announced a uh, a partnership with the with the Vermont State Employee or the VSECU, the Vermont State Employees Credit yeah. Union, um, to sort of with the credit union being a financial co-op helping f finance um, some solar projects. Um, has there been any talk about um, you know we've had the partnership with the with the Brattleboro Food Co-op, but um, other other sort of co-op partnerships? I mean, with credit unions being being kind of an obvious case, but others as well. We haven't extensively had that conversation here in Brattleboro, but you know, I think the, that's a real possibility. I mean, we have a River Valley Credit Union here uh, that has, is, is healthy, um, and they get into some um, community things that are, are good things to, to see happen. So uh, it could be a very good partnership. But we haven't we haven't gone very far along that road yet. Oh, the cooperative you're talking about is that Washington Energy Cooperative or electrical no, no, cooperative? Um, uh, it's it's one that I think primarily does um, group buying. Of yeah, group buying of fuels oh. Oh. Um, up in like uh, pellets and oil up in. Uh, it's based in Winooski, I believe. Or yeah, it's either Winooski or Colchester, but okay. yeah, some, somewhere up there. Mm -hmm. um, the, the partnership with VSCCU is specifically to help finance a solar hot water program that 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 they were uh, yeah. initiating this year. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if you know the, uh, the structure uh, in uh, Middlebury, but uh, a lot of the investment and the partnership was also with um, the cooperative uh, insurance company that is actually ha uh, resides in Middlebury. So um, yeah, that was a national, uh, sorry, a natural uh, partnership as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's great to see these energy cooperatives 
popping up because um, it's such a, you know, the, it, it, it harkens back to, you know, the origins of food co-ops where people group together to, to, to you know, get an economic edge and the, the, the barriers to renewable energy can be quite high. So it seems like a great sort of um, sector for, for applying the cooperative model. So we've got uh, about five minutes left. So do you have? Do either of you have any kind of uh, any final thoughts uh, that you'd like to sort of share or uh, about the about the project, about the sort of, sort of future you see and it, it leading towards? Um, just kind of anything anything you want to leave the audience with? Uh, patience is one I would leave the audience with. It took us a while to get the you know the solar roof project uh, to the point where it was definitely doable and. Um, so it took us talking to a lot of people, trying to attract new members, uh, trying to get the, uh, the different financing ends to fall into place. Um, we also worked with a very good installer, uh, solar source out of Keene, New Hampshire, um, which is part of the Melanson companies. They were very, very good to work with. Um, so, uh, and they were patient with us. Um, so um, yeah, patience, I would, I would certainly um, put that forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, you know there there are a number of things that we'd like to leave people with, and um, just the idea of um, coming into a cooperative, um, I think, is something that I'm, I'm hoping that more people will consider in the future, um, because it is a way that we can uh, really group our resources and make a, a big difference uh, in the future as to where we go with energy. Um, and it is, uh, you know, it, it's a big nut to crack uh, for most of us, but we're, we're making inroads. And I think, you know, Co-op Power and some of the other co-ops um, are really leading the effort. And so I'm, I'm encouraging people to, you know, take a second or third look. Um, one of the things that was surprising to me is that uh, you know, most people don't really jump on board uh, immediately. It, it takes a little while for people to really figure out what we're all about and how we work. And we really have so many different uh, parts and pieces and, and things that we can do that it, it takes more than a few minutes to be able to explain it to someone and, and really have it sink in, uh, you know, the value of, of what we can do. So, uh, you know, I'd, I'd encourage people to, um, you know, really uh, take a hard look at uh, co-op power and other co-ops as well um, as a, a vehicle uh, for helping us to get where we need to be uh, in the very near future. Well, thank you both for t so much for taking the time to, uh, to, to come in and uh, you know, figure out this, won this wonky technology, which seems to have actually held up, <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, sharing, sharing the story with us. Yeah. We yes, want to thank, thank you, Matt and Eric, and also uh, Roland on the technical uh, end here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Roland. We should thank everyone here. To yes, the thank you, <laughs> Um So yeah, we'll be um, uh, we'll be posting this this interview if you're coming to it late um, on uh, on our on our Facebook page uh, and on our website. Uh, the the website is uh, coopvt.wordpress.com. The Facebook page can be found by just searching for for Cooperative Vermont. Mm -hmm. Um, and we'll have that up probably, um, and, th and this will be broadcasting live um, on, on uh, Sunday at 7. Uh, so if you want to check that out, go to those two, uh, those two spots. And um, I believe the next episode we have coming up will be talking about housing co-ops. Yes, I believe that's um, correct. With uh, Julia Curry. We'll have right. to sort of confirm that, but that's on the, that's on the, the schedule. So um, if you're interested in uh, learning about some of the housing co-ops around Burlington, uh, you know, the, the, I think it will be definitely an interesting show. So, so yeah. you say Sunday at 7, right during the Oscars then? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, until next week, I'm Matthew Kropp. And I'm Eric Davis. Good evening. All right.